I can. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so again, yeah, my name is Marcus Fawson. I'm assistant professor here at Washington University. Um, so I'm not actually a plant biologist. Um, I'm in, actually in the chemical engineering department. Um, my lab is really interested in understanding uh, the molecular structures and interactions that affect the industrial conversion of plant biomass and its cell wall components, which we'll discuss today, things like cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, how we take the plant, how we take those components or even a whole plant biomass and industry, industrially convert them into something that's useful in the value-added product, things like fuels, chemicals, um, and materials. And so it, it does help us to have a, 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 a reasonable, at least, understanding of the plant cell wall um, and methodologies. Uh, we work a lot with methodologies of how to characterize the cell wall um, and its deconstruction. Um, and so, you know, what I wanted to do today was two really basic goals, and I'm not trying, wanting to try to go too deep. I know you guys are have a really broad background there. And, um, and so really I wanted to do is just kind of introduce the major elements of plant ECM. And in a plant, when we talk about plant extracellular matrix, we're really talking about the cell wall. And so I want to give you really like kind of basic an understanding of plant cell wall composition and structure. Um, my hope is that I know you've seen a little bit of this before from uh, uh, Rom. And I know you've had some lectures on uh, on animal cells as well. And I think one of the great challenges, and I think one of the great the opportunities that this center provides, is we can start to kind of understand the similarities between these uh, between ant plants and animal cells. And so, hopefully, you know, you start making connections about the differences between uh, uh, plants and animal cell uh, ECM um, and the similarities. Um, so, you know, just as just an, as a brief, you know, introduction, the communication between the cytoskeleton um, and the ECM is one of the uh, most characteristic features um, of cellular mechanics and mechanobiology, and it allows the cell to effectively respond to various signals, um, including um, uh, mechanical stimuli. And if we think about it, the plant and animal cells are the, the multicellular nature of the uh, plants and animals evolve completely independent of one another, but they both develop uh, mechanisms so that the cells could understand their environment. Um, and so those uh, ECM cytoskeleton uh, modes of, of, of interaction and cell-to-cell -cell interactions uh, the principles behind them differ uh, um, uh, quite widely. Um, it's quite interesting uh, when we try to start to compare some of these things because the function is actually the same. Um, when we think about animal cells, we're thinking about really modal uh, cells that tend to aggregate together, um, maybe with a, a wide range of other types of cells. You know, from a person that's a plant cell, I look at at uh, animal cells as being kind of truly naked. Um, and they tend to, uh, and they interact with the ECM in their vicinity that was maybe even made by another cell. Whereas plants are kind of super uh, super cellular organisms that are immobile um, and they you know, grow through cell division and cell elongation. Um, and again, when we start talking about the ECM um, in plants, we're actually talking about uh, cell wall. And so I, I have this, you know, two basic cartoons that from biology textbooks of an animal and plant cell. And you guys probably know way more about animal cells than I do. Um, but obviously we have our, 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 our uh, you know, cytoskeleton here is connected to the uh, a plasma membrane that has these integrins uh, integrated within them and then the ECM itself is made out of these uh, hesion molecules like things like fibronectin. The structural components are uh, collagen and elastin and an array of, of proteoglycans and the, and the biggest thing here is that 
the ECM in animals is primarily protein-based. When we start thinking about plant cell walls, though, uh, we have our cytoplasm um, with the cytoskeleton inside of it and a plasma membrane, very similarly. But the ECM is primarily uh, uh, polysaccharides. Now, in plants, we actually have primary and secondary cell wall components. And we'll talk about how those differ uh, shortly. But primarily, the ECM in, in, in plants is going to po be polysaccharide based. It's things uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and pectins. Um, there are going to be some protoglycans. Um, and then there are some other structural proteins. And then there's some cell wall assembly and cell wall um, expansion enzymes that are also part of the, the cell wall. Um, so, you know, when we start thinking about, uh, you know, one of the priorities in my mechanobiology is to understand how um, mechanical forces regulate and uh, integrate cellular activity. Um, it's well known that mechanical forces um, uh, uh, are detected by cells um, fairly rapidly and without loss of information. And these are uh, translated uh, fairly quickly into biochemical messages. And so, you know, what we want to do in, when we're at least within the center and, and with, uh, is to try to understand how this is actually happening in plant cells as much as, you know, I think there's a lot more known um, in animal cells. And so I started thinking about kind of at least in plant cells, the integrated cytoskeleton and its dynamic adhesion uh, to the plant uh, plasma membrane um, that allows kind of the inner allows the cell to to understand the mechanical forces and the chemical signals that are occurring around it. Um, what really is unknown in, in plants is the linker element between the cytoskeleton and the cell wall. So you know. There's quite often, uh, quite a bit known about integrins. There's no real homolog of integrins um, in uh, plant uh, cells. Um, and I'm assuming you guys know what integrins are, so uh, I'm not going to go into that. But um, one hypothesis is that um, there's a number of cell types in plants that have to undergo hyperosmotic stress. And so if we think about what hyperosmotic stress is, you know, this is going to be a situation where um, osmotic pressure increases. Um, there's more solute outside of the cell. Um, and so you're going to have a lot of water leaving the, the, the cell. In an animal cell, this just causes the cell to shrivel up. But because you actually have a cell wall that's actually you know, uh, uh, around the cell and the plants, the plant may shrivel, but it won't completely collapse. However, in this particular case, you need to be able to, if, if a plant cell is exposed to hyperotic osmotic stress, um, which does occur, let's say, in, in, in some root cells, um, to maintain uh, structural rigidity, uh, the, the the cell, the cell membrane needs the ability to rapidly and reversibly retract um, the protoplast from the cell wall, right? Um, and it's very unlikely that an integrin would be able to do this. And so more than likely, plant cells had to evolve a system that allowed for a little bit more dynamic interaction between the cytoskeleton and the cell wall. And this is just a hypothesis, right? Um, and there's a number of, of potential linkers that people have started to study. Um, one of these is these protoglycans that I've, I've mentioned, these uh, arabinoglycan proteins. Um, we have somebody from WashU here that's part of the center that's an expert in, in this. And this is some interesting directions that people could go in the future, right? So let's talk about the, the cell wall. Right, which is essentially the ECM for the plant. Um, it has a variety of different functions. It provides mechanical, so mechanical support, right? It defines the shape. Uh, it allows the cell to resist internal turgor pressure. So if it's hyperosmotic, it's gonna to wanna to shrink, but if it's hypoosmotic, 
is going to want to expand and in animal cells this will cause the cells to actually burst that won't happen in plant cells uh, it controls the rate and growth of uh, of the plant it's just responsible for the plant architecture it protects the plant from pathogens um, and it dictates a lot of cell to cell signal um, if you notice here we have this slight diagram of the plant cell uh, plant cell you know you have this orange or yellow layer here that is a plasma membrane um, then you have what it looks like a, a kind of a purplish layer, which is a, is being depicted as, as the uh, secondary cell wall here, and then uh, or the primary cell wall, and then you have the, the secondary cell wall, all right, or the secondary cell wall and then the primary cell wall, sorry. Um, and if we think about just the primary cell wall, we have various components within it, like I said before, primarily uh, polysaccharide based though there are some proteins there um, and the protein and the pot and the polysaccharides are going to be cellulose hemicellulose and pectin and so let's kind of go and dig a little bit into what first is the composition what is cellulose hemicellulose and pectin and then let's talk about how these things are at least known from from recent research to be integrated into the cell wall and what are the consequences with respect to maybe the mechanical properties of, of the primary cell wall. So, you know, I know everybody knows what glucose is, but I just wanted to put a couple of quick slides on here so that we all have the same nomenclature. Uh, pretty much any mon monosaccharide is gonna be one of these cyclic um, um, uh, uh, ethers. Um, and it's either gonna have five, for the most part, either gonna have five or six uh, carbons. And really it's the chem stereochemistry that differentiates, let's say, glucose from arabinose or, uh, or xylose, right? Um, and what we do is that we generally number the, the carbons on the glucose, right? So we'll start over here, we go one, two, three, four. Generally the one carbon is adjacent to the oxygen in the ring. That's how you can find the one. And you number all the way around, and then there's going to be this um, the six carbon that's kind of uh, hanging off here. Not all of the uh, not all monosaccharides that go into plant cell walls have this, and so um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll try to uh, give you nomenclature about how to say the different monomers. This is a monomer of glucose of the polymer, the, po the polysaccharide of cellulose. Cellulose is one four linked, right? So just from that nomenclature, we know that um, this carbon um, in, in uh, one monomer is connected to the next carbon at the four position, right? And in fact, this is what a dimer might look like. It's called cellulose bios. And again, you can see here, I have these numbers. This is the, the one carbon connected to the four carbon. And then you would have cellulose bios, cellulose trios, and so on. Um, or you can have cellulose. Uh, cellulose would de de denote a full polymer of or of the glucose monomer. The monomers within uh, uh, cellulose are one four glycosidic bonds, specifically beta, the beta form, right? So the alpha form would actually constitute starch. And these again are just different stereochemistries, um, but they have consequences with not only with the way um, these things form to the cell wall um, and the kind of mechanical properties they can have, but how they are deconstructed. So for example, the 1,4 glycosidic bond allows for much more readily, um, it's just, just the way it, it's formed, um, it, it forms better packing. And so you though you can have some crystalline starch, you get much more of a, a strong crystalline form of, of cellulose. These things can pack together really well, and so there's consequences that are related to this in the sense that cellulose ends up being a fairly good structural component in cell walls. A lot of times I like to describe the crystalline component of cellulose. Um, it generally forms rods. And so I like to think of them as kind of like rebar inside of concrete, right? Okay. So um, we have these 1,4 uh, glycosidic bonds. And this kind of nomenclature will pop up again when we talk about hemicellulose. Again, cellulose itself, um, I just two more really background things is that 
Uh, when we talk about polymers in general, just not cellulose, there's two basic parameters or things that we might be interested in. One is how long is it, all right? Um, so that's generally called the molecular weight or degree of polymerization. The molecular weight would be um, just the basic weight of the polymer that, that we see or the cellulose that we have. Cellulose, whether it's uh, whether it comes from a bacteria or it comes from the plant, generally is going to be a polydispersed polymer, which means there's a distribution of molecular weights, and so it doesn't just make one chain link. Um, and again, this has consequences on its mechanical strength and 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 downstream the ability to downstream depolymerize it, right? The number of chain ends themselves. Um, and then it can be crystalline or amorphous. Um, and just a little background about that. You know, crystalline material will have long range order. When we talk about long range order, we're still talking about a molecular scale, right? Um, it will have long range order and it will pack into these really specific crystal structures. Amorphous cellulose, on the other hand, though it may pack together as a solid, it's not gonna have any long range order. Um, and so there's been a lot of research done to try to understand exactly where the crystalline component of cellulose is in a, in a microfibril and exactly where the amorphous region is. And again, because of this, all of this may have, will actually have large uh, implications on the kind of structural component that cellulose can, can provide. There's actually two naturally occurring cellulose alamores. So just basically different, slightly different different structures of crystal structures that occur in nature. Uh, cellulose one beta is the, the primary form in, in, in plant material. Okay, so in the primary cell wall, cellulose is actually generated, but it's not individual molecules of cellulose. These things pack into microfibrils. And as I said before, these fibrils kind of look like rebar almost. They're actually two to three nanometers wide in dimensions, and they can be 50 to 100 nanometers long. Um, and what I've shown here is just the kind of the AFM of the, of the cell wall of, a, of an onion. And the, this is done without extraction and without drying. So this is, you know, some of this is some of the advances that we've been able to make in characterization techniques that allow us to do this. You know, cellulose has all these hydroxyl groups on the surface. And if you dry it or you try to extract it, it in inevitably causes aggregation to occur. Um, the point is that you can see here this this this, this upper inset where we where the author has drawn these kind of blue lines to kind of trace the the the, the microfibrils, and you see some aggregation at some points, and this may come in it can come uh, may have some implications in 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 a little bit. Now. Um, again, the structure of the cellulose microfibril itself has implications in, the, in, in, in how the cellulose is formed. It may tell us best ways of breaking it down. It may inform how we understand the mechanics of the cell wall. The picture that I've shown you up on the upper right uh, of the slide here is what, for the longest time, we believe the cellulose nano, uh, the cellulose microfibril looked like. Uh, we believe it has it's this hexagonal arrangement of 36 chains. And this was partly based off of, of, of rough, rough guesses of microfibrial dimensions. There was some really cool work with somebody who did some AFM. Um, it also is based off of the idea that we know how the cellulose um, synthase complexes, um, well, at least we can get TEM images of how they are embedded in the cell wall. These are the, the proteins that, these transmembrane proteins that are actually in the, 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 the plasma membrane um, that actually then produce the cellulose microfibrils. Um, and so we kind of had a, a decent idea and this rosette is one of the ways they proposed it. And so they believe it has six different proteins in each one of these small little bundles. And then you had six of these bundles. If you do that math, it, tells, it says you're gonna have 36. And so um, this is kind of where they got the 36 from. Um, however, um, through a combination of X-ray diffraction, neutron scattering, and, and NMR, the first thing they, uh, on some uh, cellulose that they extracted from the cell wall, primary cell walls of celery, um, 
first off, they found that the dimensions of the, the of the microfibrils were about three nanometers, which is a little bit inconsistent with this 36 uh, configuration. Um, and based off of a bunch of other things, they suggest that it's actually a 24 chain rectangular shaped model. Um, nevertheless, each one of these different faces, let's look at this two, two, two zero, zero face versus this zero, one, one face of the cellulose nan um, microfibril, they have different types of properties. These, the zero, the zero, one, zero uh, face is going to be where a lot of hydroxyl groups are actually facing out towards the, the edge of the microfibril. And so it actually makes these sides more hydrophilic, where the other sides are more hydrophobic. Again, this has large implications in the way we may want to form a structure or where things may want to bind. As I said, there's other components of cell wall, hemicellulose, and pectin. And so there's going to be preferential binding to various surfaces. Again, that plays into how we understand the cell wall. Again, there's some other work that people have done on these cellulose biosynthesis rosettes. And at least in this particular work, they suggest that there's actually only a trimer in each one of these small ro uh, rosettes. Um, and that these trim and then it's six of these trimers. And so this would suggest that the fundamental microfibril is actually composed of, of 18 um, glucan chains. And I just showed this to say, one, this is how people actually start to try to figure out you know, what's going on in the cell wall of plants. It's, it's quite difficult to actually visualize this directly. And so you have to look at the, the cellulose microfibril. They use techniques like NMR and neutron scattering to try to look at the crystal structures. Then you can maybe try to look at these rosettes and, you know, these kind of TEM images is the best that they can do, right? Um, and then what they do is then, with, at least in this particular study, then they overlay the shape with various compute, computational models of, of different uh, proteins and you know, uh, segments that they, that they, that they are able to um, recreate um, from some sequencing information um, and then and see how those shapes compare, right? You get a different result if you do use a different segment of the, 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 the cellulose um, uh, synthase. And so, again, this just brings up some of the complexity of trying to figure out some of these systems. Um, Okay, I want to move on a little bit. There's other monosaccharides, glucose, arabinose, galactose, xylose, and mannose are some of the major ones in the cell wall. And I bring this up simply because in, you know, cellulose, it's a linear um, um, homopolymer, which means it's a straight line and it's only one monomer. Hemicellulose, on the other hand, is a much shorter polymer. It's branched, which means it kind of makes these wide, my Y structures, um, and it's a heteropolymer, which means it can have different types of monosaccharides uh, within it. So that makes it quite difficult to describe. And then within that, there's a variety of different classes of, of, of hemicellulose, xyloglucans, um, aribinoxylans, uh, uh, glucomannins, and so on, right? Um, the hemicellulose composition, um, in the primary cell wall and in the secondary cell wall will will change drastically as you go from different types of plants to different type of plant. And this is kind of how we may des describe the structure, the molecular structure of, of, of let's say, a xyloglucan, um, where you have these 1,4 linked um, glucose monomers, but then off of the, the six unit of the, that glucose, you have things like xylose hanging off or galactose. All right, and so you have these branch structures. Um, then lastly, you have your pectins, right? Let's see here. Um, oh, yeah, just a couple more things about xylo, I mean, um, about hemicellulose, sorry. Um, so uh, hemicelluloses make up about 20% of the dry weight of the um, primary cell wall, and most primary cell wall hemicelluloses are xylo, um, uh, glucans. Um, okay, so then we have our pectins. Our pectins are polysaccharides that are also in the primary cell wall. They make up somewhere around 30% of, of the primary cell wall. And again, its structure can differ from plant to plant to plant as well. Um, the major component of a pectin are these potential acid groups. And you can see here that if you add at least 
calcium into some of the uh, into the homo. Uh, I don't even know how to say this really that well. Uh, Glucuranians, uh, I call them just HGs. Um, you can actually get cross-linking to occur. And in another form, in the, uh, RG1 and RG2s, you can get bor borate. Um, actually, boron actually causes complexation. And so the, um, and the reason why I bring this up is because this is, this is the formation of cross-links within the cell wall. So a cross-link would resemble a network. Um, um, polymer structure for those who don't know a lot about um, polymers. Um, and this is going to be something that's going to allow the cell wall to sh stretch. It's going to form, a, it's going to behave a lot like a hydrogel that you might think of um, as an artificial scaffold for, for, um, uh, for cells. And so this is where you're going to get a lot of structural, uh, re this is where you're going to get some of your structural component of the cell wall. Pectins are the most dynamic a mobile component that are quite hydrophilic. Um, and this helps reduce uh, cellulose cellulose contacts and lubricate uh, these microfibrial motions as the cell wall expands. Remember, as in plant cell walls, the a lot uh, there's going to be cell division, but then a cell elongation. And so a lot of what we try to do is try to understand a lot of these is in not only in, in that context, right? So Let's just talk a little bit about how these things are kind of put together. So the cellulose, hemicellulose polysaccharide network um, is essentially no matter how you we we view how these things are put together, it's pretty it's pretty well accepted that the the cellulose microfibril hemicellulose polysaccharide network is what resists tension, right? Which is this a force that's pulling apart the cell wall, whereas the pectin uh, network. Um, the internet intermittent meshed pectin network will resist compression and and shearing forces. Now, um, a lot of the information that we have about how the cell wall is put to, is put together, we can't directly uh, get get. We can't direct. It's very difficult. It's a hard challenge to directly visualize the plant cell wall and, and how it changes over time. And so a lot of what we've had to do is either, uh, we learned this either by using mutants that lack certain components of the cell wall and then inferring kind of function and, and, and property from that, or we've been able to in vitro reconstruct some um, uh, uh, of the cell wall using either components that we've extracted from the cell wall and separated and put back together. Um, bacteria is actually a really good source of micro, uh, cellulose microfibrils that can represent the kind of microfibrils we get out of it. And so then you can make composites that way. Um, this A structure here kind of represents what people previously believed as the model for the plumbing cell wall. It was what they, they call a tethering network model. Um, the cellulose microfibrils, which are in red, were well separated by the matrix um, polysaccharides, primarily the blue uh, hemicellulose or, or xyloglucans, which bind to the surface of the cellulose microfibril and tether them together in a kind of low bearing um, molecular network, right? Um, however, there was two basic data points that, that suggested that this model was incomplete or even wrong. First, there was a, a knockout, essentially where they took out xyloglucans. Um, and if there was no xyloglucans, you would expect to see, um, you know, maybe the plant not even to grow, right? But you saw a mild growth uh, phenotype. And so these, these plants were able to survive even without these xyloglucans. And then there's other types of plants that are xyloglucan poor, and they still grew normally, suggesting that there must be other cell wall components that contribute, um, uh, that interact with the cellulose microfibril to, to, to contribute to its function. And so B, the structure B here was the biomechanical um, hotspot model. Um, and this basically says that um, there are, 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 are limited cellulose-cellulose junctions. And at those cellulose-cellulose junctions, 
um, you actually get uh, the xylo uh, glucans to kind of glue the cellulose, the cellulose together in those specific regions, and then pectin just forms around the uh, forms around this this structure, right? So you have very limited biomechanical hotspots where um, um, where the cell wall is, is kind of held together. All right. And so this was backed up by, this has been backed up by a series of observations. First off, there's some solid state NMR data that basically says that only a small portion of the cellulose actually touches xyloglucans, right? And that the majority of that surface is actually feel, uh, covered by, um, by pectin um, or uh, by pectin. And that the, um, uh, um, and so one of the things you may think is like, okay, well, maybe pectin can't actually interact with the surface of a cellulose, right? You have these acidic groups. What will make these acidic groups want to kind of bind to an alcohol, a surface that's filled with alcohols? Um, and so there's some evidence that shows that um, um, there, there is some evidence that shows that there are certain types of pectins, particularly the neutral, the neutral sugar ones that don't have acidic groups, um, where in vitro studies have shown that pectin basically binds really well, that those types of pectins bind really well to the cell wall. Um, another thing is to think, is like, well, if you only have these very limited uh, um, uh, these very limited locations for xyloglucans, um, you know, why don't you, you know, but, okay, so I guess the best thing is to say, xyloglucans are known to bind really, really well to cellulose. And the question is, why is there only these really limited areas where xyloglucan binds to cellulose? Um, the idea has been proposed that these xyloglucans kind of like the ball up in solution. And so, as they attach to the to the cellulose nano, uh, the cellulose microfibril, um, they either stay in that conformation or don't really have the ability then to reorient. And so they have very limited space in which they uh, adhere. I think the biggest thing that you take away from this is that one, that the, the models of how people understand the plant cell wall structure uh, continuously evolve and require a number of analytical techniques to get at including compositional analysis, including uh, com computational uh, means. And again, a lot of this is backed out by, by looking at mutants that are either missing some component and but display a particular phenotype. Again, this biomechanical um, hotspot is basically saying that the cell wall extension is controlled at limited sites by really close contacts by cells, microfibrules, by xyloglucans, um, and that xyloglucans in these sites may be rendered inex in inaccessible um, by forming really tight macromolecular uh, junctions. Um, the, and they came about this is because if you put uh, a, a, a enzyme that will degrade xyloglucans into the cell wall, you don't see any loss in mechanical strength. And if you do, have, and if the xyloglucans really are to kind of glue that holds these microfibrils together, you would expect to see um, that mechanical strength dissipate. However, when you do add in enzymes that both degrade xyloglucans and cellulose, you can start to degrade the mechanical uh, uh, strength or the mechanical properties of the cell wall. And this suggests that you have to start to clear away some of the cellulose to get at these xyloglucans. And so this observation is actually not counter to what we might expect if you really do have really limited access and the xyloglucans kind of ball up and kind of only are in between uh, cellulose, um, uh, 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 cellulose microfibrils. There's also these uh, proteins that have come important lately, which are called the expanses. I believe probably Ron might have talked about this. Well, one of the really interesting things is that, again, you can do an NMR experiment where you see where the, 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 the expansins uh, land on which material in the cell wall. And if this model is actually true, 
the expanses must have some way that don't that does not rely on lytic behavior where it actually cleaves bonds um, to to manipulate these biomechanical hotspots and cause the cell wall to expand. Um, and when they looked at the the um, binding of these expansions, um, it showed that the major target was cellulose. Um, and that it seemed like it was also quite close to xylo, uh, to the xyloglucans. And so again, it, it, there wasn't primary bonding with uh, pectins, which suggests that again, this pectin kind of fills in all this space and gives the, the cell wall the ability to kind of re resist compression and shear, but the main mechanical, at least tensional um, um, properties come from these mechanical hotspots. Um, Okay, so that's basically my, my spiel for the primary cell wall. Did I guess anybody have any questions or anything before I go to the secondary cell wall? Okay. Um, so generally, when we look at these types of systems, most of this has been done on an Arabidopsis plant, right? Um, it's, it's a cousin of like Camelina. Camelina. Um, that might be something that you might have heard of before. The, the whole point is that it's really easy to grow. Um, it's been fully sequenced. You know, there's a lot of uh, genetic tools for Arabidopsis. Um, obviously, as you, you go from different to different species, the you actually see a lot of chemical diversity in in these systems. However, I would suggest that probably the, the these kind of underlying ideas about how the cell wall is kind of structured and how that may um, provide mechanical strength to the cell wall about tension and, and how it resists you know, uh, shear and compression, that it would probably be fairly global. And so the things that we're learning on on, on these, these particular plants here probably inform a lot about the plant kingdom in general. Um, it's not going to be, obviously, there may be some particular specializations that happen in particular plants that, that show really unique phenotypes or really different types of growth patterns and different things. But this is actually quite informative, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I mean, one thing we have to be quite careful about, there's a, a lot of times when people use algae, they're actually talking about cyanobacteria, which is going to be completely different than plants. But there are, you know, obviously water-based plants. Um, and, you know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist for, for plants. I, I can't say this for certain, but I would imagine it, that some of these mechanisms, some of the, uh, some of the things that we're learning here may be quite different in plants because um, in, in land plant and water-based plants, um, and particularly because there's not things that, there's not a, um, issues around um, the same kinds of issues that they have in the environment that they're in, uh, land plants would have, right? Um, but I can't say that for certain. Okay, great. Um, so, you have your, your primary cell wall. Okay, you have your primary cell wall that's going to form. Um, and then not in all plants, not in all, and not in all tissues, but you're going to have a secondary cell wall form. The secondary cell wall, in particular of woody and uh, tissue or, uh, or, or of grass is, is, is pre predominantly composed of Cellulose, the cellulose fibrils, um, lignin, and hemicellulose, right? Um, the cellulose is embedded in a network of hemicellulose and lignin. Uh, 
there's actually physical, there's actually what I would call topological cross-linking. There's probably a lot of supermolecular cross-linking that happens because of hydrogen bonding. And these, these kinds of cross-linking we actually see in the, in the primary cell wall, right? Um, in the primary cell wall, we also saw cross-linking at um, pectin sites that were related to um, ionic uh, interactions. However, there's actually going to be chemical cross-links that occur in the secondary cell wall as some of the uh, lignin mo molecules that are produced monomers that are produced actually have polysaccharide monomers attached to it. And so there's actually chemical cross-links between the hemicellulose and the cellulose. These are generally known as lignin carbohydrate complexes. Um, uh, um, however, the exact chemical nature and exact location of these is still unknown. Cross-linking this network is believed to result in the elimination of water from the wall and the formation of a hydrophobic com um, um, composite that limits uh, access of, of enzymes, external enzymes, to the cell wall. So one of the major functions of a secondary cell wall beyond uh, adding additional mechanical strength and uh, uh, is to protect the, this further protect the plant, in particular from pathogens. Um, and so a lot of the bacterial kingdom looks at cellulose as a potential food source, carbon and energy source. And so uh, a lot of fungi and bacteria produce enzymes that are designed to break down cellulose and generate glucose. Um, and so a lot of the, the structure um, and design of the secondary cell wall is actually really about how to prevent or limit access of the, these types of enzymes to the plant to protect it. Um, you know, obviously there's some 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 evolutionary pressures for for structural rigidity um, and also for water transport. Um, a lot of uh, cells that are designed uh, specifically for water transport through the plant need to have the proper balance of hydrophobic, hydrophilic surface properties so that you can actually have, you can actually take advantage of capillary forces for wicking water up, you know, if not dozens, hundreds of feet sometime um, through a plant. Um, though lignin itself it is a weaker macromolecule than lignin, there's a tremendous amount or significant reinforcement that occurs during liquefaction of the secondary cell wall, adding additional tensile strength somewhere between 25 to 75 megapascals and adding additional Young's modulus somewhere between 2.5 and 3.7 gigapascals, right? Um, cell liquefaction occurs, again, uh, after primary cell wall formation. It only occurs in specific differentiating cells or, or, or in response to specific chemical, I mean, environmental changes. Um, the appropriate timing and location of lignin deposition in each cell is essential to the function and the adaptation of the plants in their environment. Um, I won't really go into what cells and do and don't do this kind of lignification, um, but rather to say that this is uh, a very common strategy um, and um, in, uh, in both hardwoods, softwoods, and grasses, right? Um, and you know, generally we have somewhere between forty to fifty percent, at least in the, uh, compositional wise, of the secondary cell wall is going to be cellulose. Somewhere between somewhere around twenty to twenty uh, to thirty percent is going to be hemicellulose, and somewhere between twenty and twenty five percent is going to be lignin. Um, and as I said before, um, you have microfibrils. These microfibrils are on dimensions of about two to three nanometers are essentially identical to the types of microfibrils that we see in the primary cell wall. However, in the secondary cell wall, these microfibrils tend to aggregate into kind of a larger um, structure um, that we'll call a cellulose microfibril bundle. These microfibril bundles are then wrapped um, and interpenetrated with a network of hemicellulose and lignin, where these lignin and hemicellulose actually have physical, I mean, have chemical crosslinks between one another. 
Um, much like in the secondary cell wall, I mean, primary cell wall, one of the things that people have spent a lot of time doing is trying to, one, understand the structure of cellulose in the secondary cell wall, try to understand how lignin and hemicellulose are positioned. And this model that I'm, I'm proposing is, a, is the most up-to-date model, but the kinds of interrogations for structural, um, to, under, to, to understand the kind of the structural arrangement of secondary cell wall have not undergone as much scrutiny as to say the primary cell wall, in part because, uh, you know, there's a whole DOE, you know, center that's focused on primary cell wall, um, uh, um, uh, biosynthesis, and in part because it's more of a tractable problem, right? Um, you, you saw how much it went into figuring out the primary cell wall, the secondary cell wall is just that much more complicated, in part because it does include this lignin. So the structure here is a structure or representation of, of lignin. Lignin itself is a random copolymer which means it has different types of monomers. And in theory, it has three different types of monomers or major monomers. Uh, ones that have no methoxy groups, one that have methoxy groups, and a one methoxy group, and one that has two methoxy groups. These, gets in, these um, monomers get produced um, and they get shuttled into the secondary cell wall. Um, and then the polymerization for the lignin actually occurs in the secondary cell wall in the presence of the polysaccharides. Um, it's radical brick based. And so unlike hemicellulose or cellulose polymerization that is put together by an enzyme, there's no biochemical control for the production of lignin. And so it actually has a random copolymer structure. In theory, you should never actually extract out two lignin mo molecules that look exactly the same, even if you get it from the same plant. Um, this, you know, this causes a lot of chemical complexity and heterogeneity to the system. Um, lignin gets even more complicated because it is radical based when it does form the units, the linkages between um, monomers are actually different. So, for example, in, in polysaccharides, we always have a glycosidic linkage, which is essentially an ester bond. I mean, sorry, ether bond. Um, it can be either in an alpha or beta form, and it can potentially be between one four linkages or one six on the monomers. But for the most part, it's always the same chemical moiety. However, in lignin, that's not the case. Um, and this adds complexity to the system. Um, if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, though, one of the things that, that enzymes aren't good at, uh, one is this is a slightly hydrophobic uh, surface, and so uh, our hydrophobic micro, micro, uh, macromolecule, and so that's one thing. But then the other thing is that there's no particular or regular um, uh, uh, site that an enzyme can uh, uh, recognize and then uh, attack with a specific catalytic domain. Um, and so there's actually no known enzymes that work in a traditional fashion on lignin. The enzymes that are produced by microorganisms to try to break down lignin actually produce um, um, peroxide uh, radicals that then that chemistry of the peroxide radicals it stabilizes those peroxide radicals and allows those peroxide radicals to try to, to depolymerize the lignin um, and so um, there's some complexity to that um, the cellulose microfibrils again pack into these aggregates that are, are 15 to 25 nanometers um, in dimension um, if we start thinking about secondary cell wall hemicellulose versus so cellulose we have a couple of parameters here, degree of polymerization. The cellulose is going to be much longer than the hemicellulose. Um, there's going to be crystalline amorphous regions for cellulose, and, and all of the hemicellulose is amorphous. And this is also true in the, in the primary cell wall. And then we start thinking about reactivity and the ability to hydrolyze them. They have different uh, properties as well. Um, so a lot of people have done a lot of work to try to understand the biosynthesis of lignin. Again, this happens in the cytoplasma, uh, the, at least the production of the monomers, then these production of these monomers are then shuttled to the secondary cell wall, which is right on the other side of the plasma membrane um, uh, uh, to actually produce um, lignin. And so the question is, how do these 
how does lignification relate to the mechanical properties of cell wall? There hasn't been a tremendous amount of, of work done on this. And so this is a nice opportunity that we could take inside of the center. Uh, one study I've seen is where they downregulated this CAD enzyme here. And, and so the idea is that you decrease the overall flux of monomers into the secondary cell wall and thus create a mutant that has low amounts of lignin. An idea of them was to try to see if that directly correlates with the mechanical strength of those, those, uh, those tissues. And what they found was that there was a reasonable correlation. It was something like a 0 0.6 correlation, 0 0.7 correlation, um, which is not a strong correlation. And this suggests that there was other uh, factors that played much more role um, in the mechanical strength of tissues that are lignified. And one of the factors they found was how well are these microfibrils aligned? And in fact, some work that I've done in the past is where we looked at um, tension wood, which is essentially a stem where you bend the stem and the, the plant starts to grow different, uh, starts to deposit the cell, secondary cell wall in a different way to try to manipulate stress, uh, local stress, so they can bend the, bend the stem in the opposite direction. In theory, this is a way that the stem can always be growing towards the sun. Um, in fact, in those particular uh, uh, tissues, we found that the, the newly deposited secondary cell wall um, had a much lower uh, lignin content, but the crystallinity and the microfibril alignment, which was much more uh, significant. So these types of factors may play much more of a role in lignified cell, uh, cell, cell walls with respect to kind of mechanical implications. And then finally, you know, there's a bunch, what, you know, one of the things that makes, you know, plants really difficult is that you have this really complex, um, you know, diversity of properties um, and, and, sub, and substrate characteristics on a number of length scales. And you literally need techniques to get at each one of these length scales. And so you have molecular le level, heterogeneity, and, and chemical complexity. You have this kind of fibril based structure where you have cellulose microfibrils and their matrix polymers. Then that all changes depending on the kind of fed cell types that you have. And then that changes depending on the tissues. And so when we start talking about bulk properties where we just grind up a, a plant versus local properties, things start to differ. Um, and so again, it just adds complexity to the situation. In general, what my lab is interested in is how all of these characteristics affect our ability to apply an enzyme to break down biomass or apply heat, catalyst, and pressure to generate a specific product. Um, but moving forward, you know, there's some really interesting questions that we can ask ourselves. You know, what is the nature of the mechanical sensing mechanisms um, in the cell wall, pl um, plasma membrane, and, and cytoplasmic continuum? You know, how are biomechanical hotspot spots actually form? Do cells have uh, specific molecular mechanisms to control the density and location of these hotspots? Um, how are hotspots in the course of cell wall extension destroyed? We know that uh, the cell wall has to expand and actually expands. Uh, significantly, and so the thought is that you know these hotspots will have to be destroyed and re and and reformed. Um, how are hotspots regulated in the growth of, uh, in, in, res in response to growth signals? Right. Uh, what are the trans uh, transcriptional networks that that rely on sensing sensing and then responding to these cues? And so there's a bunch of really interesting questions um, that are left. Uh, are left to be answered when it comes to, to, to um, this area. In particular, uh, ones that I'm interested in because we have these kind of tools that look at compositional, the compositional makeup of a cell wall on a really local level is can we correlate some of that to the ability of, of cells to expand and grow in particular directions, right? Um, so that's basically all I have for you guys today. Um, are there any other questions?
Okay, great.